D&D is by no means a perfect game, nor as flexible as many would like you to believe. Homebrew only goes so far, and there's a reason the classic play another system response is so widespread, regardless of how annoying it may be. Plenty of other people have explained why play another system is often not a helpful response, so you're free to look those up at your leisure. What I'm discussing today is a much more specific issue within that problem. One thing D&D struggles with is nebulous concepts. In D&D, a thing is or it isn't. For instance, you succeed a saving throw or you fail it, you miss an attack or you hit it, you have a resource or you don't. The Fae, at least in myths and legends, fly directly in the face of this concept. Their magic relies on the nebulous, which perhaps explains why many of the Fae in D&D fall somewhat short of their mythological counterparts. As El King's Mill of Monarch's Factory would put it, Fae sit in the vague and evocative section when it comes to their power. Ill-defined, their magic is much more soft magic, while D&D as a system prioritises hard magic, with strict rules. Soft magic is best defined as a type of magic for which there are rules, though no limit to its abilities, while hard magic is defined as magic that works within rigidly defined rules and limitations. D&D, as quite a rules-heavy system, leans very hard into hard magic. That's not to say soft magic is impossible in D&D, it just requires significant player and DM buy-in. Plenty of other systems, typically more narratively focused systems, would work better for a soft magic approach. And that's a shame, because the Fey and the tone that goes with are truly excellent and could bring so much to D&D. The World Beyond the Witchlight module, which I hope to play or run at some point but have yet to have had the chance to, comes the closest of all official D&D products to the flavour of the Fey of fiction and fable. In some ways, I find it odd that so few D&D official modules feature the Fey, but at the same time, I do see the issue. Demons and devils, as well as the undead, are much easier to understand or characterise for players or DMs. There's a similar issue with eldritch horror campaigns in D&D, though those are also more popular than fey themed campaigns. Of course, I may be wrong in my assertions here. I'm basing these assumptions off cultural osmosis and what I see posted or talked about the most in TTRPG spaces. Eldritch horror in particular is an interesting case when compared to the fey. The word eldritch is actually derived from the word elf originally, though no longer mainly in the cultural consciousness due to Lord of the Rings, a type of fey creature. The interesting thing with fey settings is that in many cases they can fill the same niches as many of the classic adversities. Devils are known as dealmakers who constantly hide important details in the fine print. Fey often make deals where the wording is crucial to finding a way out. Eldritch horrors are known to distort reality around them and drive those that see them to madness. The Fae are associated with glamour, distortion of perception around them, as well as having a bacchanalian streak that has been known to drive mortals to madness. Undead present a foe who cannot be killed in a conventional manner. Fae often have niche weaknesses that are the only way to damage or kill them. One of the major obstacles I see for the more widespread popularity of Fae campaigns or settings is how different the rules of the Fae are from the rules of other potential adversaries. Symbols and words are very important, weaknesses can be esoteric, and the key to succeeding in a confrontation is rarely direct violence. It does make sense, then, that in a system like D&D, with so many rules for combat and so few for social interactions, the Fae might fall by the wayside. The biggest thing I think the Fae bring to a campaign is creativity. Because of how the mythology works, creative solutions are almost always needed to problems caused by them. Encouraging player exploration as well as directing players away from the murder hobo playstyle that is so often lamented. In a similar way, they also allow DMs to surprise players, with Fae NPCs acting in unfamiliar ways or using abilities that even the most experienced players won't have seen. The supplements I've made can't bring the full Fae flavour to D&D. That would be a much bigger project, but they do seek to bring some of the flavour of fame magic, while working within the existing rule set. However, I haven't made spells. I might at a future date, but at the moment the soft magic vibe of fame magic doesn't fit D&D spells for me. Nor am I making, or in many cases remaking, fey creatures to better fit the mythos. Other people with more knowledge of the mythos have already done that, and will continue to do that. No, I've made an assortment of magic items. Before I... Oh, wait. What am I hearing? Oh. Oh no, wait. Yes, what I'm hearing is scope creep. It's always scope creep. 
I started off with the idea that I would make 12 magic items, in the same way I made 12 monsters for my Clockwork Constructs video. Viewer, I did not do that. I made 31. I apparently did not learn from that project, and I doubt I'll learn from this one either, at least when it comes to limiting my own workload. So we had best get into it. In the rest of the video, I will give a summary of each myth or creature that inspired an item in the free supplement, and I'll explain each item's abilities as I go. We'll go through these in alphabetical order for simplicity's sake. Many myths are simplified or have multiple conflicting mythologies, so what I'm describing here is a version of each myth that inspired the items, not necessarily a categorically correct or agreed upon version. So let's begin with... Banshees were tied to particularly old, established Irish families. In the myth I read, the scream that they are famous for is a terrifying sound, not actually dangerous, instead warning that one of the members of the linked family was about to die. There's even a Scottish version of the Banshee, known as, forgive my pronunciation, the Benir. The item I made based on the Banshee is called the Bottled Scream. Simply, when you drop to zero hit points while carrying the bottle, the scream of the banshee echoes around you and you automatically fail a death saving throw. However, at the same time, a spectral guardian appears to defend your fallen body. The guardian remains until you die, are stabilised, or you gain at least one hit point. The feature can only be used once a day. Cold iron is a widespread weakness for fey creatures, so naturally I had to create an item inspired by it. My take on cold iron was a weapon variant in the same way D&D already has slaying weapons, weapons of certain death, or weapons of warning. My cold iron weapon deals a critical hit, may 19 or 20 to fey creatures, and any fey creature hit by the weapon makes their next check or attack a disadvantage. A fairy ring is a ring of mushrooms formed through the spores of a central mushroom spreading around it before it dies. Mythology dictated these circles as places of power for the fae, or gateways into the fairy realm. The item I have created matches the transportation aspect of the fairy ring, and is literally a ring. It allows the user to cast Misty Step without a slot once a day, as well as giving advantage to determine whether what you are seeing is an illusion or real. Multiple myths tell of the use of stocks, bodies carved from wood that the Fae would use to replace someone. In one particular tale, a stock was used to fake the death of a particular enemy of the fairies, allowing them to torment him in the Fae realm for eternity without anyone from the human realm being any the wiser. This is perhaps the most niche of the items in the free document. The fairy stock item I created can be used in a ritual to create a perfect duplicate of a humanoid, nigh on impossible to distinguish from the dead body of the chosen humanoid. Perfect for when a death needs to be faked. <laughs> Kelpies are a type of shape-shifting fae originating in Scotland. Normally tied to a body of water, they would appear as beautiful horses or uncouth humans. Their human forms were incredibly strong, and they were known to leap on horse riders, crushing them with their supernatural strength. In horse form, Kelpies would allow their victims to mount them before plunging into a river where they would devour the hapless rider's flesh. The item I have created is inspired by this second point. The Kelpie's saddle can be used to summon a beautiful and highly intelligent horse, as in the spell Fine Steed. The horse can even speak Sylvan. Just don't get too close to water while mounted. I really hope I don't need to explain what the Tooth Fairy is. However, I will say that Pathfinder's take on the Tooth Fairy is fascinating, and if you want to use it in D&D 5e, then Dungeon Dad has made a great conversion. I'll link it in the cards. The item is probably the most powerful in the free document. As suits the creature it was inspired by, the Necklace of Teeth allows the user to steal teeth from creatures, give them toothache, gain a terrifying bite attack, or lock the jaw of a creature. Well, that's a summary of the items in the free document, Fragments of Fairy. Each item in the document has an explanation of the myth or creature that inspired it, if it's not a commonly known one. 
If you want to get it for yourself, the first link in the description will take you to it. If you want to throw me a currency or two, the link to the document on my itch.io store is also down there, where you can pick your own price for it. Likewise, the link to the larger document containing 25 more Fey items is also down there. I hope this video has inspired you to add some Fey flavour to your campaign. One final thing before I go. There won't be any videos uploaded here in December or January, so the next video will be in February, assuming things go as planned. I'll see you then.